are now on doctrine number two that says, we believe that there is only one God who is infinitely perfect, the creator, preserver, and governor of all things, and who is the only proper object of religious worship. One God. One God. There is only one God, and he is perfect. He is the creator of all things. Of all things. There's four things I want us to look at this morning that are taken from <clears throat> our doctrine number two. One is that he is perfect. The second one is that he is the perfect creator. The third is he is the perfect preserver. And the fourth is that he is the perfect and just governor. But before we do, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you have given to us that which we need. So that not only are we here and breathing, but we are here breathing, living, living. And we might be able to then know you, our creator. The reason why we are living and breathing. The reason why we are here. You've created us so that we might draw close to you. I pray, Lord, each one of us now, Father, that each one of us is open to your leading. That we completely open ourselves to you, Father. There's a whole lot that you have for us. There's more, Father, than we might know. So I pray, Father, that we continually are open so that we might receive. Father, again, I pray that you speak to me the words, Lord, that I need. And speak through me the words this morning, Lord, that each person here needs to hear. I thank you, Father, for this opportunity, for this responsibility that you've given me, Lord. And I pray, Father, that you see to it that I don't get in the way of you speaking to us clearly this morning. All right, let's get back to things here. One God. One God, and he is perfect. In 2 Samuel, we see in verse 22, verse, uh, chapter 22, verses 31, it says, God's way is perfect. All the Lord's promises prove true. He is a shield for all who look to him for protection. He, his way is perfect, and he makes our way perfect. Perfect. How long have we been trying to find our way through life. In God's word it says that without him we grope along the walls as if we were blind, trying to find our way. But we can't. If we look to God, he tells us that his way, his promises prove true, and that his way is perfect. In this morning's scripture, we read from Psalm 18. Psalm 18, starting at 30, it says, As for God, His way is perfect. The Lord's promises prove true. He is a shield for all to look to Him for protection. For who is the God except the Lord? Who but God is a solid rock? God arms me with strength. He has made my way safe. He makes me sure-footed as a deer, leading me safely along the mountain heights. God's way is perfect. So then all we need to do is to look to His perfect way so that we might receive the direction that we need in life. So that we might remain sure-footed. He puts us on a path. But the problem is, as we're walking along that path, there's all these things out here. Part of our past is still calling to us. Things that we've never tried before, but we see other people doing them. They call to us. 
And they can pull us off very easily if we're not in a maintained relationship with our Creator. If we want to stay on a perfect path, we need to then make sure that we are staying in His will. When we are seeking His way, His will for our lives, He makes our path sure. And we can stay on that path, which is God's will. He is the perfect creator. Now sometimes we look at things and we say, Boy, what's the purpose of a platypus? You know, we look at some things and we scratch our head and say, what is the purpose of that? But over all things, God is our perfect creator. In Genesis 1, 2, I mean 1 and 2, right in the beginning here it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. So we know then that God is the creator of all things. And if we jump down to verse 21, it says that he looked at what he had created, and he said, it's good. Amen. It is good. It says in James 1, 17, Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. And in Ephesians 2.10 it says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, for we can do good things He planned for us long ago. And in Timothy, 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, Since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanks. That if we continue to look for God, that He puts the things in our lives that are good. But when we start to separate ourselves from God, because there are things we know, we've lived a life that was not good. We've done things that are not good. We see things in this world that people participate in that are not good. We look at our country today with what's going on. And again, this is not, well it is, there is hate. But that's not the problem. The problem is a lack of that which is good. It's a lack of the love that God has for us that we then should have for our fellow man, for each other. We're not looking and we're not receiving the good. And when we're not, then we end up doing that which is not good. That is bad for us and for those around us. So we need to, we need to continue in all that we do to look to our perfect creator so that we might receive from him that which is good. There are many things in life that are going to pull us from the left to the right, that are going to try to pull us off course. And that is why we look at here that he is the perfect preserver, that he preserves us when we are in a relationship with us, he insulates us. I, I don't know if that's a good word to use. I'd say it is. Because even though the things that are going on around us are there, we can remain safe in his will as long as we are in a relationship with him. As long as we are seeking that from him, our creator, that which is good, we don't have time for the bad. I always, and I'll, I haven't said this in a while, but one of the easiest ways to stay clean from a substance is to work on all those other things. Our language, how we see each other, how we treat each other. Those things that some people might think of as little are not little. They're big things. God is speaking to us through His Word and through the Holy Spirit. He is showing us His love so that we might share it with other people. Mm -hmm. If we are living that which God is prompting us, sometimes kicking us to live, we won't have time to use. We won't be thinking about that. 
because we're living in God's will. We're trying our best to be that which God created us to be, to love one another, to reach out to one another. See, when we stop doing that, we start going back to that self-centered person, and then all we want to do is do what pleases self. But if we are in a maintained relationship with God, we can be preserved from all that. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my safe, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust Him. Even when things don't seem to go my way, I don't run out and start taking it <clears throat> because we do this. I don't start taking direction and help from people that I know aren't living in God's will. You know, the people that say, look, as long as you don't use, you can still do this, that, and the other thing. That's not it. Because you're still living in the insanity. We have to trust in the Lord alone. In 1 John 5.18, we know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning, for God's Son holds them securely, and the evil one cannot touch them. So, are we going to slip? Are we going to fall at times? Yes, we're all imperfect. But we must make it a practice each day to do our very best to do that which God would have us to do. To live as much like Christ as we possibly can on a daily basis. We don't make a practice of sinning. We don't actively participate knowing that we're doing wrong in God's eyes. 1 Samuel 5, 29. Even when you are chased by those who seek to kill you, even when you are chased by your own thoughts of doing things that you know you shouldn't do, even when you are tempted to go back and put a substance in your body or to hurt yourself or someone else, we can cry out to God and say, Lord, help me. Help me. Your life is safe in the care of the Lord your God, secure in His, tre his treasure pouch. But the lives of your enemies, the lives of those who are not in a relationship with God, the lives of those who are not trying their best each day to do that which God is prompting them to do, that aren't concerned about God and don't care about doing things that harm themselves and others. It says, their lives will disappear like stones shot from a sling. It just popped in my head, Shooting Star. Anybody know that song by Bad Company? Mm -hmm. We live fast and burn out, and wither away and die. It's just the way it is. And most of all here, I wanted to touch on this one uh, a little bit more because he is the perfect and just <coughs> governor of all things. He created all things. He didn't just create it and throw here and say, there, fend for yourself, do as you please. Psalm 50, verse 6. Then let the heavens proclaim his justice, for God himself will be the judge. And 58, 11. Then at last everyone will say, there truly is a reward for those who live for God. Surely there is a God who judges justly justly here on earth. And in Isaiah, we see the prophecy claiming, proclaiming that Christ will take that place. And he did. It says here in Isaiah 9, 6, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. It doesn't mean the federal government of the United States of America. It doesn't mean the government of Great Britain. It means that all things that are governed by God will rest on Jesus' shoulders. That he, as he 
promised when he ascended into heaven. Not only gave us the Holy Spirit that will guide us in our lives so that we might have a chance to live as God would have us to live, but that he is an advocate for us in heaven. That he looks down and says, I paid the price for this person. And he is sorrowful for what he has done. I have paid that price. He has paid the price. Romans chapter 3. I want to start at verse 21 of Romans chapter 3 on page 1347. Christ took upon himself. He paid the price. But now God has shown us a different way of being right in his sight. Not only, not by obeying the law, but by the way promised in the scriptures long ago. We are made right in God's sight when we trust in Jesus Christ to take away our sins. And we all can be saved in the same way, no matter who we are or what we have done. Did you hear that? That the perfect and just governor and judge of all things considers us blameless when we turn to him and seek forgiveness mournfully in our hearts and accept Christ as our Savior. For all have sinned, all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet now God in his gracious kindness declares us not guilty. He has done this through Christ Jesus who has freed us by taking away our sin. So here we are at verse 25. For God sent Jesus to take the punishment for our sins and to satisfy God's anger among us. We are made right with God when we believe that Jesus shed his blood, sacrificing his life for us. God was being entirely fair and just when he did not punish those who sinned in, formal time, in former, former times. And he is entirely fair and just in this present time when he declares sinners to be right in his sight because they believe in Jesus. Can we boast? Can we boast then that we have done anything to, to be accepted by God? No. Because our acquittal is not based on our good deeds. It is based on our faith. So we, are not, so we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. Again, Christ came not to do away with God's law, but to fulfill it. So that through a relationship with God, what is right and wrong is in our hearts. So that when we look at each other with the love of God, hate's not there. There's no room for hate. There's no room for it. We don't need a list. We don't need to be told that we shouldn't shoot each other. We don't need to be told that we should judge each other by the color of our skin. We know in our heart what is right and what is wrong. That's what's wrong today. And what we see in this world, that is what's wrong. It's a lack of love. It's a lack. We can fix this problem. See? Each one of us individually. I, I try my best each day to love each person with the love of God. We can fix this problem. Christ died on a cross for, to fix this problem. Not only with our own each individual lives, 
than we, what we see in the world today. I get caught up. I get caught up in looking at the headlines and thinking to myself, oh, it's... But then I stop myself. And I think about each person that is dealing with or going through where they're at in life and what's missing. God is missing. God is missing. God's love is missing. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life shedding His blood. And this, my friends, as I have written there in front of you, is the reason why. He is the only proper object of religious worship. Because we worship things of this world. We look to things of this world. We look to other people for guidance and direction. And in most cases, I'm sure that they are separated from God. Because if they were in a personal relationship with Him, and they truly believed that Christ shed His blood and died for their sins, there is no way then they would act out the way they act out. And that includes our political leaders. People in power. You should never, and I can't stress this enough, never put anyone on a pedestal other than God. Never look at someone's advice as being 100% solid unless it can be held up to God's Word. Never look at a leader and put him in a position that he is all-powerful because he is not, or she is not. No one and no thing are above God. No one and no thing should be worshipped. He alone, He alone is worthy of our prayers. And when we and when we can get to that point in life, each one of us as an individual, and to share that with others so that others might know, then we will fix the problems that we see, the mess that we watch on the news, the hurt and the pain, the separation and the division that we see in this world. When God is first and foremost above everything else, then we have love, and then we have peace. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Father, and I, I pray, Lord, that, that not just here in this chapel, but in everything that we do, we acknowledge you and we look to you, Father. I pray that each person in this, in this chapel, Father, this morning, spends time with you in your word Lord meditating upon it communicating with you through prayer and allowing you then to speak to them so that they might know what your will is for their lives I thank you first and foremost Lord this morning because I know that we are all sinners and that we all fall short but you saw fit to give us your son Christ Jesus So that when we believe in our hearts that he shed his blood, that he was tortured and beaten and dragged through the streets, nailed to a cross, and died for our sins. Lord, when we know that as truth and we accept Jesus into our hearts as our personal Savior, something changes. We are made new. We then receive a newness 
And Lord, I thank you, Father, because when we do, Lord, we can continue then to maintain that relationship with that newness, and we will continue to grow in our relationship with you. We will know your love so that we might be able to share it with others. So first and foremost, Lord, I pray that if there are those yet to have come into a relationship with you, Father, that they have yet to accept Christ as their Savior, Father. And as you speak to their hearts and their minds now, Lord, I pray, Father, that you, you push out of the way, you, you, you let go, you get out of the way, Lord, anything that might be holding them back from making this decision this morning, the most important decision that we can make, Lord, is to admit that we are sinners and we fall short. We accept Jesus into our hearts this day as our personal Savior. We repent, Lord, of our past. We never want to go back and do the things that we've done. We surrender to you now, Lord. And I thank you, Father, for making us new this morning. I thank you, Lord, for washing away our sins, forgiving us. And Father, I thank you as well that now, as Christ had promised, we receive the guidance of the Counselor of the Holy Spirit who guides us into righteousness so that we might continue to see the sin of this world for what it is. And we might be, be able to continue to be seen as right in your eyes because we make the right decisions each day. But Father, I know that there will be decisions that we will need to make throughout our lives, throughout our walk with you, Father, because you will, make, you will make known the things that need to change in order for us to continue to grow and to draw closer and closer to you, Lord. So if there are things, Father, on our hearts and in our minds, Lord, that we know are, we're still doing, but they're not right in your eyes, Lord, I pray that we give them to you now. I pray, Lord, that each person here lays them at your feet. We ask for forgiveness, Lord. We make the changes that we need to make this day. We stop doing the things that we know are wrong. Or we start doing the things that you're telling us that we should be doing. Help us, Father. I thank you, Lord, for meeting our needs in this way. That you, the one God, the creator of all things, meets our needs this way. Thank you, Father, for your love. Help us, Lord, to share it with a hurting world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.